Good morning. Um, <clears throat> it's a pleasure uh, to be here. Um, I, th I think, in a way, um, I'm, I'm representing Etta Cohn to a certain degree. Um, Etta was so remarkably in tune with Matisse during these years from, say, 1920, um, um, 21, through um, the middle of the decade, uh, particularly because um, she, I, I have this feeling that she was listening very carefully to what Matisse was telling her. She had, uh, she made so many, you know, wonderful uh, uh, choices. Uh, during these particular years. Um, I want to um, thank Eva Lamp for the volume and the team uh, that worked on this book. I felt uh, as if I was moving through Etta's mind in a way uh, in seeing how many times Etta's choices, um, pictures like the yellow dress, um, interior with dog, um, how, how many of these works um, came into the collection and um, really um, underlined her knowledge and you know, acceptance of what had been difficult works uh, for other people. Not sure I got... Well, actually, let me go back one. <laughs> I, I added this. Um, phrase that came from uh, the conversation that Matisse had with Terriod, uh, talking about how disappointed he was with the actual production of the Mallarmé book, um, even though uh, Le Courier had worked on it very carefully and Marguerite kept a very close uh, eye on the progress, still Matisse was uh, disappointed uh, I think primarily because the actual drawn lines didn't look like they were drawn with pen or with, with pencil. They didn't have that sense of, uh, of materiality. Uh, in spite of that, um, they, Marguerite uh, and Matisse made this uh, decision that the Mallarmé maquette would find a wonderful home uh, in Baltimore with the Cones. Remember that there were overlap over, um, sh overlapping trips between uh, the visits to Ada Cohn in her apartment and the presence of um, Matisse up here. There was no actual uh, contact. As far as I know, uh, Ada never made any um, trips to the Barnes collection, it was completely, uh, and Barnes never came to him, but they were, but Matisse was visiting both of them simultaneously. Um, so he felt that the maquette, which he put together, which is, I'll talk a little bit about later, is so revealing and so complete in its uh, uh, educational mission uh, that it was really uh, intended by Matisse to explain sort of step by step everything that was important to him in the creation of this uh, amazing maquette. Um, so um, now what I was particularly interested in as I've been looking through Matisse drawings uh, is to try to figure out if there are certain drawings which I would call more preparatory. Uh, Matisse was thoroughly involved with every aspect of drawing, uh, as you may know. Um, and the, um, the commitment to um, bringing together that maquette, which had uh, first initially been a kind of sales uh, technique for Skira, that you would, he would be able to sell a version of the manuscript with, um, with all the drawings and all the refuse plates. Um, as, as part of his offering to a very special collector. But at some, at some point, they decided that the most efficient thing to do, and actually uh, the place where the maquette would really have the most serious educational um, uh, achievement would, would come if it was kept together and then went to uh, Baltimore together with the other works from these same years that Etta was, was buying. 
I wanted to um, especially thank my um, former colleague, Tom Primo, uh, who was conservator uh, at the Baltimore Museum, is now at the National Archives, uh, for asking a lot of questions uh, about the nature of Matisse's um, drawings, such as um, one might consider in this particular uh, comparison. So I've selected one of the um, music lesson pictures that the Cones bought in 1921. Uh, and asked myself, uh, well, just exactly um, what could be called a preparatory drawing? Is this um, drawing that I've um, picked here uh, have anything to do uh, with these uh, particular works? And there, uh, I think what I would say is um, I mean, that when one looks at this drawing and then one following, uh, these are clearly drawings of, a, of another kind of category that we don't usually see, r rarely actually coming on the market uh, in a way, I would say. Um, but, but to see how uh, Matisse is really using this uh, drawing as a way of planning out the composition, uh, where the decorated material, um, certainly communicating the closeness uh, between uh, these two at their music lesson, um, I believe this is Marguerite, um, uh, on a very familiar um, couch. Oops, sorry, the wrong way. Uh, and then this particular drawing, where there's absolutely no attention to the background at all, to locating them in space, but rather the emphasis in Matisse's drawings uh, is on the um, I think communicating the, this intertwining of, of the two figures together, uh, particularly with these dark graphite uh, lines that create a kind of uh, arabesque. Um, but I don't think this was definitely a drawing that was made in the context of, um, of figuring out the, this particular picture um, um, rather than um, achieving um, a, a specific, uh, a, another purpose in terms of an independent drawing. Um, one has to show um, the great pictures of the two sisters. Uh, of course, uh, Clarabelle, who died in 1934, doesn't play. Uh, I mean, um, you know, let's see, Clarabelle died. How could I forget this? <laughs> Clarabelle died in 1939, um, and she um, Th this particular portrait uh, is legendary because uh, Etta had ordered uh, a single portrait for uh, to remember and to be published in a book on the Cone Collection. Um, and then uh, it took a long time. Matisse took a lot of long time getting to the actual work, and Etta um, kept after him uh, until uh, he arrived with the surprise of a of a complete um, set of. Of, of five drawings of Clarabelle and then uh, another six or seven uh, of Etta, both of which they were totally uh, not expecting. But it, it, it underlines this uh, sense of appreciation that Etta uh, had for these drawings made in serial. Now, these certainly would not be in any way you know, referred to as a preparatory drawing because they really do move from one drawing to, to, to the next in, in a very um, um, definite way. Um, this wonderful drawing of Lisette, um, a, a black a charcoal drawing from 1929 um, 31, uh, is probably the first of the uh, drawings that kind of introduce. Um, uh, Liz, Lizette as a as a model, uh, so not in any way uh, at this point necessarily um, part of the yellow dress campaign, but rather um, uh, a drawing which is extraordinarily perceptive in terms of her personality, uh, which you can read a lot about in uh, Hilary Sperling, um, and. Uh, uh, her the sketching out the yellow dress with the yellow, with the ribbons, um, but it's this concentration on the face that one really thinks about. So again, um, 
not a drawing that I would in any way call preparatory, but, but one that really stands by its, in its own in, in isolation. A recent gift um, from uh, Barbara and uh, Barbara and uh, uh, gosh, um, B Claude, yeah, how could I, you know, from Barbara and Claude uh, to the museum uh, has brought together a suite of 14 drawings that were made that, I'm, that I would definitely call uh, preparatory, exploratory uh, drawings um, for the yellow dress. Uh, you'll remember that this picture um, uh, started in 1929, and it's a bit unclear when the campaign actually, it was certainly either late 31 or maybe possibly even into 30, uh, 32. Uh, but let's take a look at these uh, uh, drawings that uh, have come in to accompany. Um, Tom Primo has, has um, taught me a lot about looking at the very precise details of drawing in terms of paper, uh, the texture of the paper, how the graphite uh, comes off the tool on the paper. Uh, and clearly, uh, these drawings uh, that were made of 14 were about um, uh, communic learning something about Lizette's uh, uh, personality, uh, learning something about, uh, very quickly, almost what, uh, what Matisse would call sort of un unconscious or reflexive drawings. Um, very flat, I mean, these graphite lines are right against the paper, very flat, um, very, very little indication uh, at this moment uh, of any uh, sense of uh, volume. Um, Evelyn and I have spent some different, some, some time looking at these drawings, uh, and his point uh, very well made that what Matisse was doing here was gradually turning the figure uh, frontally uh, so that um, it would, and you can see it in this one as well, this wonderful uh, curved chair is a, a kind of um, um, holder in a way, a, a way to keep the figure sort of draped on these figures. So you do, you do get this precise, you know, this sense of a uh, volume, but still, the the face really isn't forward, sort of turning to the left. Um, another one of the yellow dress drawings, uh, which is particularly uh, wonderful because of the degree of concentration. Uh, on her face, looking absolutely straightforward. Some of the personality that we see, saw in that early um, uh, black chalk drawing. Um, another one of the drawings uh, for the yellow dress, where you see uh, Lizette in the familiar hat. Now, in this time, uh, we would make, uh, you know, it's, we've made quite a bit of progress in terms of the model uh, turn, turning frontally, uh, which as you know from looking back at the painting, uh, it is a key factor to the way that the, the figure is changing in the course of Matisse's work on the painting. Now, this, this drawing is particularly um, problematic, but I think it, it brings a very important change to the sequence of drawings. Uh, what we've been looking at previously have been these graphite line drawings, um, which are um, very, very much you know, straightforward in terms of really getting something to learning about the, the model, exploring her personality, looking at her expression, seeing the way what she can teach Matisse, or Matisse in, in showing her within the chair. But when we get to this, um, we've, we've come upon a different kind of graphite line, uh, a, a thicker, heavier, softer line uh, against the, the whiteness of the paper. Um, pretty much all the details that we see in the picture are there. But what's so extraordinary is how the sense of scale uh, is, is so different. Um, she she looks like she uh, Lizette looks like she's um, just absolutely overwhelmed by the exterior d decoration and has none of the monumentality that we'll eventually uh, see in the painting. 
Uh, I believe, uh, it feels to me that what's beginning to happen in these drawings where Matisse has added uh, shading um, and is that he's beginning to look at this, the figure volumetrically, and particularly using the chair in the background as a, as a, uh, um, a way to kind of structure the composition, bringing her more vertical. Um, and uh, it seems, in fact, what I would say is very, very painterly, the, the application of shading. It even reminds me a little bit of, uh, of Cezanne, the way these lines are suggested like that and then uh, given some volume by these uh, um, narrowly uh, spaced uh, lines. Um, another drawing of the, what I would call this group B, um, the, the second drawings that, uh, that again show uh, Matisse beginning to uh, add these uh, volumetric, it, it seems as if, I mean, Matisse knew how to do everything when it came to, to drawing. I mean, there was, and he, would, he took on these challenges, so, but he knew what he needed to explore, what he needed to uh, uh, record in terms of this uh, series of drawings. These, these kinds of drawings are, you know, as I said, uh, not that common on the market. And when, the, when you can link them together, um, it's, uh, ex it's exciting to see. Um, another drawing that shows us, again, uh, a remarkable change. We're getting ever closer to the picture. First of all, um, sh with the exception of that slight lean of the head, we're definitely approaching a, a, a vertical composition. And uh, we, we, uh, Tom figured out that um, all these little dots uh, down here are the result of uh, erasure um, over time, just kind of discoloring. But I think the fact that we can know so clearly that there uh, is this very strong uh, involvement with erasure and, and all these little bits have been left from that procedure, uh, it again, uh, reminds us or tells us that we've moved into a different category of drawing, which is more, more about, yes, still concerned about the verticality, but more working on the volumetric aspects of, of her figure. And these little uh, bits of erasure tell us that there's um, an awful lot of erasing uh, going on as that modeling takes place, which seems to be a, a sensibility, an objective, which is um, very close to painting and very much unlike the contour drawings we saw previously. So again, going back to the, to the actual painting, um, I think particularly in here when one sorts out the, the, the lights and the darks and the highlighted areas, uh, they actually correspond very closely to what we see in, in those um, later preparatory drawings. Um, another picture uh, here uh, where one looks up close at some of the, um, the areas of dark and light, which uh, again follow very closely on the, uh, the drawings uh, that we see for the yellow dress at this stage. Um, the drawing that is the very closest um, to the, the painting is uh, this one here. And, and it, we could number it the sort of last in the group of Group B drawings, uh, where it's certainly the closest in every way, whether it's the position of the hands. Um, we're still, he's still using elements of the chair to, to create, to sort of form the, the shape of her lower figure, the hands, as I said, are, are very similar. Um, the, the, the head is in no way sort of turning from right to left. It's really less now about personality and instead um, a really um, strong uh, communication of the, of the uh, form of the figure. Uh, now, there are a couple of drawings that um, are, are 
you know, somewhat odd and ha hard to explain. Um, these, this is a, a pen and ink drawing. So made, you know, obviously uh, for the old dress, so 29, 31 in that period, probably a later drawing. Uh, it, it's very much out of the, the sequence of the drawings that we've seen before. It sort of looks, um, um, you know, mysterious what the objective of this drawing is. Uh, I, I, have some, I have the feeling, um, especially knowing a story about the Combs, um, Etta uh, came to Nice to see the yellow dress for the first time. Um, and she was, uh, became really set on acquiring it. And Matisse did this very lovely thing. He created an, um, um, a, a reenactment, really, of the painting in the studio by bringing Lisette in, uh, dressing her up in the yellow dress, um, and um, in a way sort of creating a, a, a souvenir um, after the, the process is gone. We don't know, you know when this particular drawing is, is dated. But it seems that the use of pen and ink um, uh, in the uh, articulation of the, the figure is um, you know, very much different than the other drawings we've seen. So I think more in the presentation realm rather than the preparatory realm. Again, these you know, may seem like picayune, picayune considerations of drawings curators, but it's uh, you know, it's very important, especially in a uh, w working with an artist who's so motivated and in tune with every uh, aspect that can be achieved in thinking through uh, an object like this. It's it's very you know challenging, but worthwhile to try to uh, get a picture of it. Um, uh, Evelyn talks in the book about the importance that we eventually will get to um, having more x-rays and more up-close look of painting construction. We, we've actually done very little study of our uh, Matisse paintings uh, to this point, but um, you know, in terms of really peeling back the layers of meaning that we can find from doing that, like the great exhibition in Chicago did. Uh, but um, here, um, you know, it's it's that same sensibility of trying to find a, a sense of what uh, what is happening. Uh, this is a, a wonderful photograph of Lizette uh, dressed up in I, that amazing hat um, and this wonderful yellow dress. Um, this probably. Um, was I, I believe this to be have been probably the event that Matisse staged for uh, Etta when she came actually down to see the picture for the first time in Nice and actually um, make the purchase. Um, this same photograph um, is often paired with another one that shows probably the last uh, stage of work on the painting, but there's um, really very little to see there that helps us out to know um, in what um, order these things are occurring. Uh, I also wanted to call attention to um, this funny little etching um, that I hadn't ever seen before, um, which shows Lizette here uh, looking at the mirror this uh, is a very contrasting um, kind of line. It, it almost feels, in a way, like a graphite drawing, but, but actually it's, it's etched line with a, fairy, a fairly heavy uh, push on the tool as he's drawing it. Uh, it it's so um, whimsical, in a way, and personal um, that um, you know, it, 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 again, feels like uh, something that could have come you know, later, some kind of done in a smaller edition something more private and personal as, as, again, a kind of souvenir of, of the end of what was a long campaign for this, this work. Um, now, the great Mallarmé uh, maquette. I've, I've chosen um, to portray myself in here because I want to emphasize uh, the fact that uh, viewing the maquette is such a, um, an extraordinarily um, difficult um, thing to do properly. Uh, it really uh, needs to be. This is actually how it came uh, in these beautiful, in these leather boxes with gold 
tooled. And I, I credit uh, Marguerite with um, doing all of this uh, arrangement. In this remarkable uh, maquette, we, we are taken through, um, through the book, one plate after another, where Matisse shows um, every possibility um, that he's thinking about, not only in making his choices, but, but also um, offering commentary in the way of refused plates as to which things are not, um, not working or need to go in another direction. Uh, it's, it's, I look at the, the, looking at the maquette in, in a way as a performative thing where you, you can imagine um, Matisse in back of you um, with commentary about this and that, but actually it's very self-explanatory. Um, for instance, as one works from uh, these early drawings, uh, which are in fact um, tracings of, of other drawings, and then moves forward to the uh, where he finally wants to get stage after stage, refused plate after refused plate, to get everything just exactly right in terms of the way the figure on the left um, sort of moves through the sheet, the attentiveness to the image and the, the text, uh, everything, the choice of the red A, um, everything uh, about it is laid out in such a, a personal uh, and remarkable way that, that it, um, it really deserves the kind of notoriety. I wish that I you know, could take each of you through a tour of the maquette plate by plate, uh, because that really was the most fun for me. But it's also the uh, most accurate way uh, to really show what's going on. Um, for the plate apparition, um, Matisse worked uh, very carefully through uh, a number of inspirations, going back to the great plumed hat drawing from 1919, which is in the Cohen collection. Uh, but then uh, by doing tracing, so he would have drawn the, the work on the left uh, first, and then uh, by putting this, doing a tracing of it, he's able to do the, the reductive way that his eye is moving in terms of, of creating the simple figure, but still with all the, the flow um, and um, sensibility that one comes in the earlier one. Uh, or this you know, wonderful sequence of um, Matisse sketching swans. Uh, this is a, um, a work which is in the Pierre Matisse Foundation in New York. Uh, which is we think is actually a kind of mock-up, which is something that was very unusual among these books. Um, the paper looks familiar in some ways in terms of lining up with some of the papers we've seen other graphite drawings on. Um, but but clearly, a you know what could be a kind of introductory uh, sketch, uh, and then. Uh, on the left, again, um, all, all very carefully numbered. Matisse would say what comes first with the Roman numerals, uh, also with the blind stamp of, of maquette to make sure that nothing was confused. You can see how these uh, swans are beginning to, to take visual shape as they uh, are arranged on the, um, on the page. Uh, and then the extraordinary uh, transformation to one of the later uh, uh, swans where you um, see how it's completely filled the page and is moving out in, in every direction. And then the final um, uh, swan that we see you know, carefully placed in relation to the text. Um, I think my favorite uh, of the drawings in the maquette is this one. Um, Chevalier, where the uh, again this drawing is you is is traced um, by um, on traced from the original drawing so that uh, it, it begins to open up and and flow, but is absolutely um, centered in the um, the, the uh, way in which this these dark graphite lines uh, picking up against the laid paper are, are drawn.
Um, I thought you know I could probably skip some of these, um, but it is important that Matisse uh, continued to send at a, uh, of course, the um, photographs of the pink nude, which she was uh, going to acquire, uh, but a number of these amazing charcoal drawings, which uh, eventually lead into the seated pink nude. Um, uh, and what Matisse's aim in was doing this, I don't think that he was uh, cam campaigning necessarily for her to, um, say, purchase this work to go with the blue, with the pink nude. I wish she had. Um, <laughs> that would have been extraordinary to have them together. Um, but I think that he really understood her interest, particularly in the serial um, development of, of images. Um, also, there was this um, acquisition made of the early version of the large reclining nude with the wonderful uh, checked fabric that you see on the painting uh, there. Now, obviously, uh, you know, this, I wouldn't call this a, a preparatory drawing based on its distance from uh, the, the painting. Um, by any means, but 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 certainly it it stands um, alone, uh, you know, as a as an extraordinary uh, example of of the way that that figure is modeled, and it's amazing to think of its evolution into the the flattened figures that we're familiar with. <clears throat> um, another um, challenge. Um, is the uh, is a work like this called Blue Eyes? It was always thought that this was a drawing for Blue Eyes, um, but when in fact um, the drawing comes um, after um, the painting, um, you you can certainly see um, in this the the attentiveness to to shading and the the power and how how this design needed more space. We added a sheet so that it could. You know, extend further, uh, uh, really taking over the wholeness of the sheet. Okay, and then I just wanted to bring this little announcement and surprise uh, to us about this very uh, strange little ceramic work that um, arrived with us only in the past month. Um, this is actually a a work that. Um, Max Weber uh, owned uh, and had actually purchased from Matisse when he was uh, a student of Matisse. Um, the, so it, it lived in Max Weber's studio uh, for a long time. And when Joy Weber died recently, um, this marvelous, uh, um, although I think somewhat humorous, uh, <laughs> take on the, the blue nude um, you know, ha has come our way. Um, so I think that's um, that's the story of those works. Um, and I hope that that what can be achieved is that we can look more deliberately at the drawings to try to figure out at every stage uh, what they tell us about the evolution of uh, Matisse's scene. Thank you. <laughs>